for the, the nice introduction. Um, it's really my pleasure and honor to be here to talk to you all today. Um, what a fantastic lineup, and we've already heard some really exciting work. Um, so uh, I, I wanted to take a, a moment to, to zoom in uh, in my talk. We've heard a lot of high-level talks about what is consciousness, um, how does consciousness arise from the brain, and I wanted to share with you a little bit about what we've been doing to specifically ask about how consciousness arises, both neurally and computationally, in the lab, so that you can kind of get a handle on really what goes on in a research lab that, that tries to understand these topics. Um, and I, I'll, before I'll, I'll do that, I'll, I'll just preface this by saying that it's really a great privilege to be one of the people working on this, this topic. This is one of the most exciting and simultaneously frustrating topics that we could possibly be working on in science right now. So we, we don't even have a handle really on how to begin studying it. Uh, and so some of the things that I'll share with you today are hoping to create that handle, to create that, that little spark to be able to say how can we, can we get um, a grasp of the, the neural basis of consciousness in the lab and what kinds of techniques will need to be developed in order for us to be able to do that. <coughs> Okay, um, but before we, we drill down into the details of the experimental uh, approach and the theory, I wanted to start with a question that I think or I hope will resonate with, with everybody here in this room, and that is, um, how many of you drive a Tesla? <coughs> okay, a few hands. Of the people who put your hands up or of people who have ridden in a Tesla, do you trust its self-driving algorithm? Truly. Do you trust it the same way that you do a human co-pilot? Maybe not. Maybe not. Um, and so I want us to ask ourselves, why don't we trust the Tesla the same way you might trust your spouse? Well, maybe that's a bad question. Um, <laughs> but if, if, if your Tesla had to choose between hitting a baby stroller and hitting an old lady or killing you, its occupant, it would probably make a very reasonable choice based on the software that it has been programmed with. But would it make exactly the same choice that you would, or that your spouse might, under the same circumstances? And so by asking ourselves these questions, I think we can start to see that as smart as our current AI is in Tesla, or in image classification, or in any sort of deep learning, as smart as our current AI is, it's not making decisions the way we do. So it's not integrating information the way we do. It's not predicting things the way we do, as Anil was talking about earlier. Um, and so uh, because they're not making decisions the way we do, um, it, it, we can kind of come to the conclusion that they're not really creating conceptual understanding of the world around them. They're not building, maintaining, and querying internal generative models of the world the same way that, that our brains are doing for us. Um, and so even though these machines are actually quite good most of the time at making very reasonable decisions, when they're wrong, they can be actually very, very, very wrong in ways that we would never, ever be wrong. So sometimes this is quite comical uh, in the case of robots that miss the, miss the door handle and then just completely fall over and fail. Um, and, and so despite the fact that this robot here uh, has the same speedy reaction time and precise motor control that you might think is in your Tesla, it's still falling over. But sometimes this is not quite so common, like when Uber's self-driving Volvo killed someone last year. Right. And so I think that it's really important that we understand the differences between how these machines are integrating information from their sensors uh, and building and querying and maintaining and evaluating their internal models of the world, the differences between how our current state-of-the-art AI is doing that and how we're doing it. Because honestly, we're really quite good at doing this. Humans are still winning at a lot of these tasks, at least for now. So what is different about how a machine is doing this versus how a human is doing this? And I think that one of the answers to this question has a lot to do with our consciousness. And so we've heard about this a little bit today, and we heard about this kind of offline last night at the opening uh, dinner. But I think that um, the, the big computational advantage that we currently have over our state-of-the-art artificial intelligence is that we have metacognition. We have the ability not only to build and maintain and run these predictive models in a forward manner, 
But we also can query those internal models to say, how good is this internal model to begin with? How good is the result of my decisional process? The, the result of all of that integrated information or information integration, did that do a good job at giving me the truth about the world that's out there? And so uh, the, the supposition that metacognition um, is related to consciousness and not just to intelligent decision making is kind of the foundation or one of the foundations of the higher order theory of consciousness, which uh, Dawid pointed out yesterday in his kind of uh, death match uh, um, program that he is building um, and that we'll be, <laughs> that we'll be going to in, in two weeks uh, in New York to start to hash out uh, the, the experiments that would arbitrate among higher order theory and first order theories of consciousness. Um, unfortunately, higher order theory didn't make it into our, our rap presentation last night, but maybe next time. Okay. Um, so uh, this is great and this is a nice theory, but how can we then go test this in the lab? Um, and, and what kinds of tools do we need in order to be able to evaluate whether it is this metacognitive assessment ability that gives rise to our conscious experiences and gives rise to intelligent decision-making behavior. Uh, so first, though, what is actually metacognition? So I've given you kind of a taste of this. I say it's a, an abstraction, an ability to evaluate uh, the world around us um, or the internal models that we have, but what does it actually look like? I'll point out, I'm, I'm a human neuroscientist, so I study this in humans, not in AI, but I still think that, that we can go forward with this. Um, okay, so uh, this is you. You have a brain, you have eyeballs, and you probably have experienced a driving condition that looks something like this, where it's foggy, uh, it's kind of dark, and your windshield is wet. And so your task is to evaluate what's out there in the world so that you can react and make decisions accordingly. And so in this toy example here, I'm gonna ask you to evaluate what this thing is. What is this thing? And to help you, uh, I'm gonna narrow it down a little bit for the sake of argument, and I'm gonna say this is probably a deer, a car, or a tree. So I actually do this right now. What do you think this is? A car. Okay, I agree with you there. Um, but what comes along with this assessment automatically, without you even having to think about it, is an evaluation of how likely it is that your decision about the, the identity of this object is correct. Right? You feel like you have some sort of probability that you made a correct assessment. And that's automatic. Your brain does this anyway. And, and so you can see that this metacognitive evaluation process which we do automatically is relevant not only for things, decisions like how fast should I drive given how well I think I can see, or is this sound relevant to understanding what that thing is out there in the world, but also do I have enough information to make a determination of what that thing is anyway, or should I gather more information? This is a second order meta level assessment. And uh, related to consciousness, is the signal that I'm evaluating something that even came from out there in the world to begin with? Or was it just internal noise, the spontaneous fluctuations that I have going on in my brain all the time? And so you can see, again, that this is great for biological systems. This is also something that we want our artificial systems to be able to do. And when this metacognitive system breaks, maybe we start to see some sort of hallmarks of psych psychiatric illnesses, um, autism, schizophrenia, maybe errors in this metacognitive evaluation process. Um, the problem is we don't know how any of this works yet. We have a lot of theories, but we really don't know how this works. Uh, and so what my research program is trying to do um, is understand how, both computationally and in the neural implementation, and where in the brain these metacognitive processes arise. Because we are the proof of principle. We are the existence proof. We do this. We know that this is good for us that it helps us make better decisions. So if we can figure out how we do it, maybe then we can fix it when it breaks and, and imbue artificial systems with this ability as well. Um, so now we're gonna go very briefly into how we actually study this in the lab to give you a little teaser of what this is like on a day-to-day -day basis. So this is uh, kind of what we do in the lab. We, uh, we stick electrodes in people's brains when we're allowed to and we record the activity and we throw machine learning classifiers at it while they're doing some task. And we say, great, this is the neural representation of this information. But this isn't the end of the story, right? This is just a data-driven, bottom-up understanding of this pattern means this and that pattern means that. But we don't know why yet. So we have to couple this kind of complex, machine-learning-driven, data-driven approach 
with the building of generative computational models that say, how is this information being used in the brain? So we build these neural networks that suppose how specific pieces of information and specific computations give rise to both the decisional process and that meta-level assessment of how good the decision was to begin with. So this is cool, um, but how we test these theories then can't be just this passive uh, thing where we, we say what does the theory predict and we go do an experiment and then we're done. That's not a great way to test a theory. You want to also couple these computational data-driven and theoretical mechanistic explanations with ideally closed loop hypothesis testing. Um, and so this would be a great way to introduce closed loop neurostimulation uh, into the picture. The problem is that in humans, because I am a human neuroscientist, we don't have a great way of doing this with both precision and in a way that is non-invasive, right? I can't just go sticking electrodes into people's brains unless I have very good reason to do so. So we need tweezers, not a hammer, and we need to be able to do this non-invasively in humans. Okay. Um, and so I'm going to tell you very briefly about one of the techniques that we've been developing um, in collaboration with the folks at ATR in Kyoto um, and my former postdoctoral mentor, Hakon Lau at UCLA. Um, and so this is called uh, real-time fMRI decoded neurofeedback. So we all know how neurofeedback works. You look at a thing, you, you're told to change your brain activity somehow, and then you receive a feedback signal that says how well you were able to change your brain activity. And if we do this with EEG, we can get pretty good temporal resolution, but the spatial resolution and the precision of the type of mental state that we are inducing is kind of restricted to are you paying attention or not? Are you uh, experiencing physiological arousal or not? Um, but the contrast here, and so then the feedback circle, sorry, is related to how, how well you did. Um, but the contrast here with this decoded neurofeedback is that during this period where you're changing your brain activity, we're actually applying machine learning classifiers, classifiers to the precise spatial representation of a particular target idea in your brain. Okay? Um, and so then by, by applying to uh, the classifiers to the pattern, so this is like the highway signs that have uh, not just the number of lights that are being lit up, but we care about the precise pattern of lights on those highway signs that lead to left lane closed versus right lane closed, okay? The same number of lights are turned on, but the meaning is totally different. So if we can induce these types of patterns, and then the feedback circle is related to the, how well you were able to, to create the target pattern in your brain, now I can start to induce things, and we can do some training over a few days, now I can say that I can start to induce precise representations of a target idea, a target concept, in a non-invasive method that, oh, by the way, is also completely self-generated, so I don't need to actually zap you with anything in order to do this. <laughs> so this has been shown now that, that you can do kind of basic science things, like if I induce the pattern that goes with redness and not greenness, I can make you see red more. Um, if I induce the pattern that goes with spiders and you happen to be scared of spiders, then this acts kind of like an unconscious exposure therapy to spiders, which is amazing. So now what we are doing in my lab is not just saying a data-driven pattern like a spider or redness that came out of a machine learning classifier, but we're actually using our computational frameworks to build uh, theory-driven patterns that we will then induce to test our theories and hopefully to improve um, or at least better understand how metacognition takes place. Okay, so this closed loop neural stimulation that's theory driven, this is I think um, one of the, the most powerful things that we can be doing right now in studying how consciousness and metacognition arises in the brain. So um, that's kind of where I'm gonna stop here. I'll say that of course these, these techniques are great for basic science and I wanted to share with you a little bit of what the basic science looks like but don't forget that there is application here, right? So if we can use this closed loop decoded neurofeedback and push around on or at least better understand the, neuro, uh, the metacognitive process and the neural basis of it, the computational basis of it, then maybe we're gonna get to, um, hopefully in the near future, medical intervention techniques on smarter AI. So I'll stop there and uh, thank you very much for your attention.